Jesus once asked his disciples a question, who do men say that I am? After hearing various answers, Jesus turned in a personal direction, but who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus Christ and what do we know about him? The Bible provides answers to this all important question. If we would know Christ rightly, we should consider not only his person and his natures, but we ought to understand his offices. Join me as together we explore the offices of Jesus Christ and their significance. Well, welcome to our new class on the offices of Christ. I'm Pastor Brian DeYoung, and we're here at Grace OPC in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. This is a class that I have wanted to teach for quite some time. And due to various reasons, I had to wait, but I was always anticipating this particular study. And I think it's going to be very valuable and encouraging to you. As believers in our Lord Jesus, we love our Savior for all that he is and all that he has done for us. As Christians, we want to know more about him. We want to understand his person and his work. And we can increase our knowledge of Christ by studying his divine essence, by looking at his person, by considering his various relations, his relation to God the Father, his relation to the Holy Spirit, his relation to his own people. We can also profitably study the work that he came to do on earth and what he has accomplished. And this leads us to consider his offices. Now the Reformed perspective on Christ has really emphasized something called the munus triplex, the three offices or the threefold office of Christ. He is prophet, he is priest, and he is king. Many Reformed theologians, as they deal with Christ and his offices, deal with these three things. They handle everything under this rubric, prophet, priest, and king. And we see something of this in our Westminster standards. In the Shorter Catechism, question 23 asks, what offices doth Christ execute as our Redeemer? And the answer is, Christ as our Redeemer executeth the offices of a prophet of a priest and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. And that's a wonderful, good answer. It is very consistent with the reformed position. But there is another aspect to this whole discussion of the offices of Christ, which make me think that maybe it's more appropriate to broaden a bit and consider more than just the three offices. When we look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 8, it speaks of Christ the mediator. And in paragraph 3 of that chapter, listen to what it says. The Lord Jesus, in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell, to the end that, being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of a mediator and surety, which office he took not unto himself, but was thereunto called by his Father, who put all power and judgment into his hand, 
and gave him commandment to execute the same. So there in the Confession of Faith, chapter 8, paragraph 3, it speaks of the office of mediator, of mediator and surety. And then it speaks about how this office came about, how it came to Christ. He took it not unto himself. He didn't volunteer for it. But it was given to him by the Father who called him to this office of mediator. Furthermore, the Father put all power and judgment into Christ's hand and gave him commandment to execute the same. And so here we have a fourth office, the office of mediator and surety. Now, you might say that the office of mediator is the umbrella which covers the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. And there are some who treat the matter in that way. That's not a bad or illegitimate way to treat it. But I would prefer to suggest that there's more than just the three offices. Now, I'll concede prophet, priest, and king are the major offices of Christ, but I would also say that there are other offices, maybe secondary offices, that are worthy of our consideration. And so as we go through this class, and as you'll see later on in this lesson, we're going to cover prophet, priest, and king, but we're going to cover other offices as well. So let's now turn to the scriptures, because the Bible gives us the foundation for our theology. We always want to make sure that our theology is being drawn from Scripture, that we are exegeting these things from the Word of God and reaching our theological conclusions based on what God reveals in His Word. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5, and let me read verses 1 through 6. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. As for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now there's a number of things to consider here, and this particular passage is dealing with the office of priest and Christ's work as our great high priest. The first thing we notice is that priests are appointed by God to act in matters pertaining to God. And so divine appointment provides the authorization needed to function in a particular matter. And that divine appointment comes at God's pleasure. He is the one who decides who will serve and how they will serve. Notice also that they are taken from among men and they are appointed on behalf of men. So there's this pool of human beings, God knows them all, and from that pool of human candidates, he chooses those who will serve in this particular capacity here as priests. And then he appoints them to that role on behalf of men. So they are serving in a representative capacity. And in the case of the priest, he is serving on behalf of the men from whom he was taken. 
And so a priest represents man in matters related to God. Then notice that they do not take this honor upon themselves. This is not volunteerism. Volunteerism says, who wants to be a priest? Who'd like to be a high priest? Raise your hand if you're volunteering to be a high priest. And in such a situation, obviously, the whole credit goes to the person who volunteers. This is not how any of this works in God's economy. He doesn't seek volunteers, but rather he appoints men. He calls men. He determines who will serve in this role. And so he receives the honor when he is called by God. And again, a positive call to office is needed for a man to serve in a particular capacity or function in a specific role. These men who are appointed to these offices have duties to perform in their official capacities. In the case of the priest, it is their duty to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So they were appointed to kill the animal, to drain its blood, to cut up the carcass, and then to burn the body on the altar. They also have the duty to deal gently with the ignorant and misguided. So these priests were not only offering these animal sacrifices, but they were dealing with the worshipers. And as they dealt with these worshipers, many of these worshipers were ignorant and misguided. And so as the priest was to interact with the worshiper, he was to be gentle pastoral, caring for them, understanding of them. He was obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, first for himself and then also for others. So much of the priestly work had to do with the whole sacrificial system. This leads us then towards a biblical definition of office. And for our study on the offices of Christ, it is very important that we know what we mean by the word or the term office. And here's what I would suggest as a formal definition. Office is a formal position determined by God, whereby the person is called and set apart for a specific role, given the authority necessary to carry out that role and assigned specific functions to accomplish in that role. So let me go through that a little more slowly. It is a formal position determined by God. God is the one who determines which offices he wants to function in his church and how those offices are to be defined and described. And so he creates the office, the position, and then he calls the person into that office. The person is called and set apart for a specific role. Suppose that our community was being overrun by wild dogs. Let's say wild feral dachshunds. And the city government decided we have a real problem and it's only getting worse. We need to appoint a dog catcher. And so here is a very formal role defined by the city government, Sheboygan dog catcher. And this dog catcher is given a task to do, to go out and round up all of those wild dogs, to rid the community of the menace of feral dachshunds. He might even be given a special uniform which says Sheboygan dog catcher. 
And he is to go out and fulfill that role, to do that work that he was assigned to. So you see, the office is a role created by God, determined by God, that a person is called and set apart to that office. They are given the authority necessary to carry out their role, and then they are assigned specific functions to accomplish in that role. You have the authority to apprehend and confiscate these wild dogs, and you are to make sure that they are all cleared of the streets of Sheboygan. Now, this draws out a point which I think is very important for us to understand, especially in our modern context. The idea of office cannot really be separated from the concept of the functions of the office. The office is set up in order to accomplish certain functions. We don't want to divorce these two as if you could have the office, but you don't need to worry about the function. It's an office, an appointment unto the function. Now I say that this is important in our current day because in our civil realm, we have men and women who are given office, but they don't ever carry out the function. They don't do what they are supposed to do. Years ago, there was a particular senator who was elected by his constituents in his state, but this senator never really attended meetings of the Senate. He never cast votes or went through the legislative process. He didn't serve on committees because he just wasn't there. He didn't do his job. And when that happens, when someone holds office, but they don't do the function, well, they are misunderstanding and mishandling their official capacities. They weren't elected or appointed just in order to fill space and collect a salary but they were appointed and elected in order to do the work they were called to do. And so this idea of having a divorce or a separation between the office itself and the function of the office is not at all sound or good. If you have any officer who is appointed to office who refuses and fails to fulfill his functions, well, frankly, he just needs to be removed from that office. And someone needs to be put into the office who will do the job that that office is designed for. And that's just as true in the civil realm as it is in the ecclesiastical world. If you have a pastor who never does any pastoral visiting, who never goes out to visit, say, the widows, or who never prepares sermons or leads Bible studies, who never shows up even on Sunday to conduct public worship services, well, you've got a man in office who's not doing his job. He needs to be removed from that office because the office is not an end in itself. It's really a means to accomplish the end. It's a position in order to fulfill a function. Now we take a look again at the example of Christ in his office as a priest. And let me read for you what the Westminster Larger Catechism says in question and answer 44. How doth Christ execute the office of a priest? Christ executeth the office of a priest in his once offering up himself a sacrifice without spot to God, to be a reconciliation for the sins of the people and in making continual intercession for them. So here we have Christ appointed to be a priest and he has a task. His task is to offer himself as a sacrifice without spot to God. The purpose of this 
task of offering himself up is to be a reconciliation for the sins of the people. And he is also given the secondary task of making continual intercession for the people whom he represents. So here we have an office, the office of priest. We have the function, offering himself, making continual intercession. We even have the goal or the rationale. Why are you doing this? To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And so all throughout scripture and even throughout common understanding of our civil order, office and function are really two sides of one coin. Again, you know, we can think about this in terms of an analogy between church officers and civil officers. Now, we understand there's differences. There are distinctions between church officers and civil officers. But in both cases, the position is granted authority in order to fulfill the functions and carry out the duties. And so as we think about offices and officers, at heart, at the core, it is true in the civil realm as in the ecclesiastical realm. Now I want to give you a little bit of a preview for where we will be going in this particular class. We are going to start by looking at the whole concept of office. That's what we've done today, understanding office. Next week, we will take a look at the office of mediator, how Jesus is the one mediator between God and man, and how he carries out the function of mediation. After we've looked at his work as mediator, we will then turn our attention to his work as our prophet. And we're going to spend three weeks on Christ as our prophet. We're going to look at the biblical data which establish that Jesus is a true prophet of God. We're going to try and understand what his function is as a prophet and how that impacts his people, how it impacts you and me. After we've looked at his prophetic office, we will turn next to his work as a priest. He is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And once again, we're going to be taking a careful look at the scriptures and what scripture teaches. And then we are going to be seeing how that works out in the actual ministry of Christ, both in his time on earth under the state of humiliation and after he ascends to heaven in his exaltation. Following the priest, we will consider Christ as our king. And I would suggest this is the office that we are most familiar with, perhaps we think about most clearly, and in some ways has great importance for us. And especially as Reformed Christians, as Presbyterians, we value that Christ is the one and only king and head of his church. And we want to understand and submit to his royal authority as our king. After we've finished with the king, we're going to touch on a number of different offices which are perhaps secondary, but not unimportant. We're going to look at him as our judge. Christ the judge. And this has to do with this life, but especially with what will happen at the end of the world when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. We are going to consider Christ as an apostle. And the book of Hebrews calls him this. He is the apostle. And so he is sent forth by God to proclaim the word and to draw his people unto himself, Christ the apostle. Another office which he holds is the chief shepherd. Peter speaks of this. He is the chief shepherd over the flock. 
And we're going to think about his work as a shepherd, his function as a shepherd. And a number of passages come to mind. Psalm 23, for instance, or in the book of John, it talks about how Christ is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. We will then conclude by looking in three different lessons at Christ as a minister, or we might say a pastor, Christ as an elder who governs his church, and Christ as a deacon who carries out an earthly ministry of mercy to poor, needy folk. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. I think this is going to be very stimulating. And as we study together, I hope that this grows and encourages your faith that you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ more fully and more truly. And that as you know him more in his official capacities, your heart is going to be loving him more which will then lead you to serve him with great thankfulness and gratitude. Well, thank you for your careful attention, and we will look forward to what the Lord has in store for us in these lessons in the weeks ahead. Thank you very much.